Hi guys, welcome back for episode number 25 of the weekly playback. I only have a couple of games to talk about this week, so I will just get right into them. So the first game I will talk about is Winter Haven Woods. Now this is a game I had back from Kickstarter. Um, so this, you know, I guess since I just received it, I guess it's a 2022 game officially. <laughs> I don't know. Um, it's designed and the art is also done by Joel Bodkin and the publisher is Featherstone Games. It says it's for one to six players. I did mean to play a solo game of this, but it didn't happen. Instead, I played a two player game of it, um, but it is an absolutely beautiful game. I mean, look at this box. When you open it up, you see this. It's just beautiful. The artwork is really stunning in this game. I absolutely love it. It's got these beautiful like winter animals in it. So it's a bit of a set collection game, card drafting set collection with some take that. So um, in a two player game, well, I will start out by saying that we messed up accidentally because of it's my fault. Um, I was reading the rule book and I somehow forgot that we were supposed to play five rounds instead of three in a two player game. So I did mess that up. And afterwards I felt like the game was super short and I was like, you know, just felt just when we were getting started, it felt like the game was over. And then when I went home and reread the rule book, that's when I realized we were two rounds short. But even with five rounds, I feel like it would probably still be a bit short for a two player game. So basically each person, so first before I get into the gameplay and how it plays, I will say that um, I am a sleever and I sleeve these cards with um, Sleeve Kings. I think it was, is that the standard edition or standard American? I can't remember. No, actually, I think they're Game Genix sleeves, actually. Sorry. These are Game Genix sleeves that I used for the standard size um premium game genie sleeves and they did not all fit in this box like not all of the cards from the base game so what i did was i took an expansion box for petrichor and i added some of the stickers which i had also purchased um, from the pledge manager for winter haven woods and i covered the box with those stickers and i also even put one of the stickers that i got on the inside of the box <laughs> so um let me just show you so yeah, on the inside of the box, I put one of the last stickers. Um, and then the two player aids that were in the main box, I stuck in this um, small box. And then all of the Heart of the Woods cards, which is what you start the game with when you begin playing. And then the score pad and all of the scoring cards are in this box, as well as the expansion, which has some really beautiful cards in it. So I just want to show you. So this expansion has some additional, I believe, scoring cards. Oh, gosh, just look at that. Isn't that just beautiful? Oh, I just love the artwork in this game. It's just absolutely stunning. But yeah, look at these Aurora Borealis cards, which will be coming up in a minute, I think. Or did I already? Oh, here they are. Oh, I just love that. They're just so pretty and I really love this card too. Yeah, so just a super beautiful game with just really stunning artwork. So I have not yet played with the expansion, but I would like to because those cards are just so beautiful. So since everything did not fit in the main box for me, I put them in this Petrichor box with the stickers on it to try to make it look like a Winter Haven Woods box. So I did the best I could. Um, the designer actually reached out to me and said that if you, because I had asked him, you know, I had mentioned that not everything fit and he said that um, he did mention in a couple of updates and on the Kickstarter page or somewhere that if you used the um, tight fit sleeves or the perfect fit sleeves, then everything that belongs in the base game box would fit into the base game box. Um, but then I actually read some reviews of those kind of perfect fit sleeves that say that they can actually damage cards. They can make the... Um, the ink like kind of rub off of the cards. I don't know. So, you know, I'm still trying to decide what to do. Um, but anyway, so the game itself, you start with a Heart of the Woods card, which I just showed you, which has three trees on it. So you're trying to populate your woods. So once, once you have a group of three trees, which everyone will get to start out with, then you will get to place some animals under those trees. Um, so, you know, and you'll have a drafting phase where each player starts with a hand of seven cards and you're going to pick a card then pass it around until everyone has seven cards and then you'll have a pop no, a planting phase where you'll plant trees and try to have more groupings of woods for animals to then join and then you'll have a populate phase where you can add different animals to those different groupings of trees and there are restrictions like you can only have uh 
you can only put deer to a group of trees if they're in pairs, so you cannot just add one deer to a tree, but you can add two deer to a group of trees. Um, you cannot mix gray and red squirrels in a grouping, so they have to keep separate. Um, rabbits can join any animal, but I think it's one rabbit per group, I believe. Hedgehogs don't go anywhere, they just stay in your meadow. Um, and hedgehogs, you know, I guess they're just basically free points because they can't even be eaten by anyone else um, during the hunting phase either. Um, so yeah, and then, you know, you uh, one thing we didn't pay attention to is that some of these trees actually have birds on them. And you'll actually get like set collection points for the birds at the end and we weren't even paying attention to the birds. So then after the populate phase, there is the steal phase. So if you have some animals like a fox, you can steal um, a critter from someone else's meadow. Or if you have a beaver, you can steal a tree card from someone else's meadow. Or if you have an owl, um, you can also steal a critter from any woods. So yeah, so then you can steal and you, the more steal cards you use throughout the game, the more of a penalty you'll get in any game scoring. And then there is the hunting phase. So if you had any animals that are hunters, such as bears and wolves, then they will hunt at that point in time and bears must hunt each round and then there are wolves and wolves can only hunt if they are in a pack of three so it's an interesting game with interesting mechanics i would like to play it again um like i said we messed up in the two-player game because we did not play enough rounds but i can totally see how it would get interesting with more players and more rounds um, one of the interesting questions that came up oh and there are some bonus scoring cards as well at the end so you score for like the different trees in your meadow at the end of the game you score for let me see what else you score for yeah, you score for hedgehogs, populated, critters and deer, predators, hunted and resting. Um, then you get bonus for most deer, a balanced diet, like, and you know, animals that have hunted that have eaten like three different types of animals, uh, good growth and birds of a feather. Um, and then you subtract any penalties for stealing cards. Um, and there are like different other kinds of bonus cards that you can score with as well if you choose to. Um, it can be interesting because one of the questions that came up in the forums, and this was kind of coming up during our game as well, if you choose not to steal, you can turn those cards, sorry, if you choose to steal, once you've stolen from someone, you turn that card sideways in your meadow because then that card will count against you. If you choose not to use a steal card during the steal phase, that card immediately gets discarded. Now, if you turn a card sideways, the question that came up in the forum was, can someone else, can someone else's predator eat that stealing card during the hunting phase? So can a bear or a pack of wolves eat either a beaver, an owl, or a fox? My answer would be yes, because it would make for an interesting mechanic. If someone else's predator can eat one of your stealing cards, they're feeding their animals, so that helps them um, and helps them get the points and you know helps them maintain the animal that they need for the next round. And then it reduces your penalty points because they ate an animal of yours that stole from someone else. So I think that would make for a very interesting mechanic. If the answer is yes, you can definitely eat um, an animal, a stealing animal that someone used in that round. So I'm going to play it that way because I think it works more interesting. It makes for a more interesting game that way. But yeah, so this is a really beautiful game. Um, you know, I haven't played it enough times to really, you know, say whether it's a very good game or not, but I liked it and I'm looking forward to playing it again and of course you know with us having a big snowstorm outside right now I feel like it is the perfect game to play um, because we are definitely in a winter haven right now there is a lot of snow out there unfortunately we do not have bears and foxes and stuff around here although actually there was a bear one time I saw run across the road in front of my car and until that happened I did not believe that we had black bears around here because I'd never seen one um, but I just wish we could see more of them because I love animals and I love bears um, so yeah so that was the first game I played and Dobby is making a lot of noise um, yeah so let's go on to the second game so the second game I want to talk about is Llama Land so Llama Land is designed by Phil Walker Harding. Um, the artist is Clemens Franz and the publisher is Lookout Games and this came out in 2021. Now this is a tile placement game. I really liked it. I played a three player game of it and the reason I bought this game was because of llama meeples. So 
Um, I just will show you some of the llama meeples. They all look the same, so. But yes. So in this game, you start out with a tile. It's an interesting game. Um, each person starts out with a different starting tile and you are basically going to be adding different tiles and building up your terrain and you're trying to feed different llamas and then add those llamas to your terrains and meet different scoring objectives. So there are a bunch of different cards in this game. So let me show you some examples. So this, there are, I believe, um, three, no, four different types of llamas. So in order to get a llama, you need to feed them different food items. And so there are llamas that are, you can feed cacao to in order to get, and they're going to be stacked in a row. So each llama, different llama type will be in its own row with the highest scoring points on top. There are llamas that can be fed corn. There are llamas that can be fed potatoes and then the llamas that can be fed cacao. So you'll have the highest scoring llama on top and I believe there are eight llamas in each row and three different types of llamas. And so you are going to have these like scoring objectives laid out um, that will be selected at the beginning of the game. Um, so for example, this one says, uh, huh, no, not this one. Let me, let me find one that I actually understand right now. <laughs> um, are these the scoring objectives? I can't remember. Okay, here's one. Like for example, this one says you need two llamas of each type in order to get the scoring object objective. So when you are playing, basically on your turn, you can take a tile and place it down or you can, gosh, what was the other thing? It's one or the other, I believe. Um, so you can do that or is it f extend no so place a tile yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, i thought there was like a choice between something so you can build or i thought you can feed a llama regardless okay so maybe i'm confusing something so okay so when you're building so you can turn the tile as any way you want and if you are extending like say you are putting the tile outside of the original um, starting tile, then you can place one of your tokens somewhere on the scoring objective. So if you put your token here, that means if you score the scoring objective, you'll score 15 points and then someone else can't take that spot. However, the next time if you want to move it from one scoring objective card to another, if you extend again, you can move your token from one card to another. Um, so yeah, so on your turn, you are building and you can also feed a llama, but you can only feed one llama per turn. Um, what else? Um, you're going to collect different things. So when you cover up spaces, then you will get to collect those items and tokens. And that's how you end up feeding llamas. So you have a bunch of different tokens. So like if you end up covering this corn and cacao, then you will take a corn and cacao token. Oh, oh, I forgot the other thing. The other thing that you can do is to, oh no, sorry, that comes from um, collecting something. If you cover up a village space, that's when you get to take a villager. So you get to select a villager who gives you a once per turn special ability. And these are really helpful for trading. So like you can trade a certain number of corn for cacao or whatever, and that really helps you to feed more llamas. So I believe the game end trigger is when um, a certain number of tiles, because it has a bunch of different shapes, um, are empty or if a certain number of llamas have been taken, I believe, fed. I cannot remember exactly what the end game scoring condition is, but I thought it was a really fun game. Um, I had heard from some others that they thought the game was kind of boring, so I was a bit worried about that, but I actually really enjoyed it. Um, excuse me. And I actually played this game with my friend who is around my age and his seven-year-old son, and both of them kicked my butt so badly. I think the ending scores were my friend had 125, his seven-year-old son had 118, and I had like 85 points, something like that. <laughs> so um, I did really badly. Um, 
and then afterwards we were discussing strategies and stuff um you know my friend he's a very smart guy and his kid is very smart and uh you know he's basically training his kid to become an expert board gamer like himself <laughs> so so you know um actually during the game when we were playing my friend actually took a picture of both of us playing his son and me and he's like oh i'm taking a picture of a cutie pie and a hopeless board gamer because i tend to lose to his son and him a lot um, but i really enjoyed it and i look forward to playing it again and it says in the rule book that there's even an expert variant so i'd be curious for what the expert variant is so yeah at the end of the game you're just basically going to total up the points on your llama cards you know the objectives you've met i think you can convert leftover tokens into points as well um yeah I think that's it. Oh, and then coins, leftover coins can be converted into points as well. So yeah, I mean, if you like tile placement games, I think it's a fun game. And I'm glad to have another like llama kind of game. So before the only other Peruvian kind of themed game I had was, um, God, what's it called? The title is hidden from me. Um, oh, uh, Altiplano. Altiplano was the only other like, um, you know, Peru Machu Picchu kind of game I had um, so I'm glad to have this game in my collection and I will definitely keep it in my collection I had actually gotten rid of Baron Park which was also designed by Phil Walker Harding um, I'm just looking at what else he's designed oh gosh he's designed like 67 games um, so um, let me just see by year I don't think I have any other of his other games now since I got rid of Baron Park um, yeah, I don't think I have any of his other games at the moment. Um, one of his other most recent games that came out the same year as this was Summer Camp. And I didn't feel a need to get Summer Camp since I had Pine Ca uh, Camp Pine Top. Oh, he also did design Sushi Go Party and I do have Sushi Roll, which he also designed. Oh, I didn't know he designed that, so I have Sushi Roll. Okay, so this was the next game I played and I liked it and I do recommend it if you are into tile placement games and or if you're looking for like a Peruvian kind of themed game. Um, the next game I will discuss is a game I don't have with me. It's called, I'm going to butcher the name, Condottery? Con, Condott, Condottier? Condottier? I don't know. Okay, so it's a 1995 game. It's uh, designed by Dominique Erhard and Duccio Vitali. And the artist is Dominique Erhard. Um, I think there's a couple of editions of this game. Um, there's a bunch of other artist names as well. Uh, and it says for publisher Euro games. Uh, I don't know. Um, but yeah, it's an older game. It's a 1995 game. Um, it was a good game. I'll throw up a picture. Basically, you are dealt a hand of cards each round. No, not each round. That's incorrect. So it's kind of like an area control game. So you're going to have a certain number of cubes and you are dealt a bunch of different kinds of cards. and I would classify it as a trick-taking game, but it doesn't actually list it as one of the mechanics. So, you know, I'd be curious what actually classifies as a trick-taking game because I would have called this a trick-taking game because you do have cards of like kinds of different suits and some cards trump others. Um, but at the same time, you're not necessarily trying to follow suit. So maybe that's why it's not a trick-taking game. Like you, when you place a card down, someone else places a card down and then the next player places a card down. Whoever ends up having the highest total will get to take control of the region that was being contested at that time, being fought over at that time. And, you know, there's a pawn that you can move around to show which region is being contested over. And in order to win, you need to have either four adjacent regions within this map or a total of six in order to win. I actually won. There are different types of cards um, and they do different things and you know some cards can change the values of certain things. Some cards can make all players discard a certain card. Um, some player some card would allow you to end the um, round immediately and make whoever has the highest number at that point win. Um, so I don't know if it's actually a trick-taking game. Um, I feel like I want to do a bit more research into actually what classifies, qualifies as a trick-taking game. Um, but it's an interesting game. You know, for a 1995 game, I really enjoyed it and um, I really liked it. I thought it was pretty strategic. And after a couple of rounds, I really started to understand how to manage my hand of cards so that I could play you know, effectively and hopefully win. And I did win. Um, 
It was pretty cool. So yeah, I really liked it. Um, you know, I think if you're into that kind of a game, if you're into kind of um, bluffing, but also area control, I think it's a really good mesh of both of those. Um, and, you know, with a tiny bit of a trick taking element, again, I don't know if it classifies as that, but I think maybe a little bit. Um, so yeah, so I really liked it. Um, I, I would recommend it. You know, I know it's an older game. Um, I would actually look it up and see, you know, if it's available to buy because I thought it was fun. Um, yeah, so check out, check it out. It's a conductory, I think it's called. Yeah, so that was fun. I really liked that. Um, the next game I'll talk about that I played um, was again, actually I'll talk about that at the end. So the next game we'll talk about is Kariba. So Kariba is designed by Rainer Knizia. The artist is Felix Kindelan and the publisher is Goliath Games and it was published in 2010. Now this is an interesting game. The mechanics are interesting because the mechanics are listed as hand management and rock, paper, scissors. So basically you are going to have a watering hole and the watering ho hole is going to be like this round, like, uh, um, have to, is it, what do you call a thing? What is it? No, eight sides, octagon. It's going to be an octagon because I think it's got eight sides. <laughs> so you're going to number it in order. So it's going to be, I don't even know if I should even bother, but like, you know, so you're going to have it numbered from one to eight. And when you play cards, you are going to have a hand of five cards. And on your turn, you can play any number of cards, but all the cards you play have to be of the same animal. So let's suppose my hand was, um, let's see, how many cards do I have here? One, two, three, four, five. Okay. So if I had this, I could play both of my cheetahs or I could just play one of them if I wanted to, but that's all I would be able to play because you can only play one kind of animal at a time. So in order to, so the game is like this, you're just basically trying to collect the most cards. And once that round finishes, whoever has the most cards will win that round. Um, they did say that they recommend playing three rounds because, and then um, whoever wins the most of three rounds uh, or actually record the score after each game and then the one with the highest total score will become the winner. So at the end of each round you will count all of the cards that you collected and then whoever has the highest number after three rounds would win. So if you want to collect cards um, you can take any number so oh, it's hard kind of hard to explain without a visual. Um, let's suppose there are two cards under eight so two elephants under eight and then there are like four cheetahs nearby under six. If I were to place another elephant, that would make it three elephants, allowing me to pick up the next closest uh, number near the elephant, except for one. And no, actually it could be one. One is the only one that can take one that's higher. So one can take eight, but eight can take anything less than it. So if one happened to be the only grouping of cards after the elephant, then you would take those. But let's suppose there were no cards under seven and the next grouping of cards was the cheetahs, then putting a third elephant down would allow you to take all the cards underneath the cheetahs. And that's basically how it works. Um, and again, mice are the only ones that can take over the elephants. So if you end up having a grouping of three or more mice, then you can collect whatever cards are underneath the elephants. So I liked it. I thought it was a interesting, clever game, definitely more strategy than meets the eye. Like when I first picked it up, I thought it was going to be like a very easy kind of kitty game like oh you know because it comes in this tiny little box like I didn't I was not expecting much out of it but it actually became super competitive as me and my friend were playing <laughs> and um, I kind of kept on giving away like wins to him like I would try to strategically place down cards so that I would hopefully get to take a big group of animals when my turn would come but then you know I don't know what he has in his hand so then he would end up getting to take a large grouping of animals instead but yeah if you like animals you know 
and quick little card games. It's a it's a good filler card game, I think, but definitely more strategy than meets the eye. But yeah, if you like African animals, definitely check it out. I really I really enjoyed it. We had fun playing this. And of course, you know, it's a fun little game and it doesn't take up a lot of space. I definitely think um, I will take it to Africa with me because I'm going on a safari, hopefully this July. Um, I had booked it for 2020, but then the pandemic happened and then it didn't happen again in 2021. So I think it would actually be really fun to play this game with people while I'm on a safari. But I am going alone, so I don't know if anyone will be in the same like kind of tour group as me and whether they will want to play this game or not. Um, but we shall find out. But I will be taking this game with me to Africa for sure. Um, so yeah, so that is Kariba. And I, you know, I think I might, I, mean, I think I do like it. Um, so I recommend it if you are looking for a nice little filler game. Um, and finally, the last games I will talk about are Paris Eiffel, because I finally got to play with the expansion. So Paris Eiffel is designed by Jose Antonio Abascal Acebo and the artist is Oriel Hernandez and is published by Devere Games and the original base game came out in 2019 and the expansion came out just recently so I believe 2022 or maybe 2021 but I think 2022. I really like the expansion. I really like playing with the expansion. It definitely made for some more interesting choices. Um, I feel like the pieces in the expansion definitely um, can both help you and your opponent or hurt you and your opponent like it made for much more interesting scoring and much more higher scores so at the end of the game my opponent scored 47 and i scored 44 because i did try to use um some oh no things are falling apart so i actually used this but unfortunately i did not use it properly so that didn't actually include work in uh, you know, to my benefit in the score. Uh, my opponent was able to use some of the stuff to his benefit, even though I had originally planned to use it to my, it's like, you know, it's just really hard to explain, but I went over the game in the last video and how it plays. And I think it's a really good game, but I think that this is a must have expansion. Like if you ever play a game and you're like, yes, you know, the game is definitely improved by an expansion. This one is definitely improved by this expansion. It makes for a much more competitive game. Um, it just becomes way more unpredictable who is going to win. Like without the expansion, with just the base, you could kind of see who is going to win based on how things are panning out not so with the um, things in this game. So, you know, the Arc Di Triumph and the, um, this thing, and then the, um, these pieces, the skull and the gargoyle really make for a much more competitive, unpredictable game. So definitely recommend the expansion. Definitely get this expansion if you like this game and play with the expansion. Um, so yes, yeah, so that was Paris Eiffel. Um, so those were the games I played in the last week. Um, it's still been difficult to play, you know, higher player count games. I'm hoping that that will change um, going forward. So, you know, the only games I was able to play at three players this past week were Llama Land and Conductory. Um, so the games I am backing. So let's go on to that. Um, the games I'm backing are currently still Hike. And then I had mentioned in the last video a game that I wanted to back but only 100 copies were being made of it. So I ended up backing it at the $1 level because I think a print and play will become available. So it's called Substan... 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 Blah. Why can't I talk? Subsistence. Okay. I was trying to say subsistence and I kept wanting to say substance and it just wasn't working. Okay. Subsistence. Subsistence. There we go. Okay. So the game I'm backing is called Subsistence Card Game and it is designed by a New Zealand um, designer and so again he's only limiting limited oh my god he's limiting the uh, Kickstarter to a hundred backers oh I can see the person because I follow people on Kickstarter so I can see that Shem Phillips is also backing this game but I don't know if he's one of the lucky 100 or if he's also going to get the print and play who knows um, I think he's based in New Zealand too, actually. Okay, so anyway, so this game, um, they're going to make a print and play available for those of us who could not get one of the 100 copies. So it says in 4500 BC, the world is an untamed place. place. 
I cannot talk today. Forests teem with ancient beasts, fields, uh, fields sway with wild grain, and fens bubble with hidden mysteries. This world is yours to claim, but you can't do it alone. So you're going to build idols, develop your land, develop the land, and begin your subsistence. Um, so yeah, so what is subsistence? This is a compact resource management game that imagines the world behind the ancient standing stones of Neolithic Britain. So I messed that up. In the last video, I mentioned that I thought it was about the Easter Island statues. No, it's about the Neolithic Britain stones. So that was my bad. Um, so it's played over nine turns and you're going to be building a tableau of idle and land cards, placing developments across their domains and etc. So um, it looks really nice and you know I, I like the artwork so unfortunately I wish I could have gotten one of the hundred copies because it looks like it's going to be an absolutely gorgeous game. He's uh, publishing it on um, he's like I think he's self-publishing it and he's like got these beautiful wooden boxes that he's going to be um, delivering these in. It just looks like a really beautiful game with wooden tokens. Yeah it's a it's a really nice game. Or it looks really nice. I mean, I haven't played it. So yeah, so I'm backing that. Oh my god, what is wrong with me today? Okay, um, the next thing I'm backing, it's not a board game, but I'll just mention it anyway. Um, one of the TV shows I had watched that I really liked was Lupin. It's a French series. Um, so I'm backing the hardcover Arsene Lupin, Gentleman Thief, and it's coming, it comes with like some drawings of um, Lupin and it's you know it's basically the book that the series is based on so I thought that would be fun to get so I'm backing that. Oh and there's one more game that I'm backing at the one dollar level which I had covered like a year ago I think but it didn't meet its funding goal so now it's back on Kickstarter. It's called Finding, Finding Anastasia. Um, so it's like a social deduction game about Anastasia, Anastasia and um, yeah, so that I'm um, backing at the $1 level because it actually did fund now. So I'll just be getting a production copy of that. Um, so if you are an Anastasia fan, I would say check that out. I'll include a link down below. Um, and now I will go to games that I have received um, or bought. Um, so the first one I will show is recently I went to Rochester um, because uh, Millennium Games was having a sale and I was hoping I might be able to pick up something fun from the sale but unfortunately um, there was nothing really left in the sale that I wanted um, but there were some games that I had heard about that I really wanted so I picked those up. So I'd heard a lot about this game called Innovation. I don't know if you guys have heard of it. So I bought the base game and one of the expansions. I haven't had a chance to play it yet. It's an older game. Let me just look up when it came out. I think it's 2010 if I remember correctly. Yep, 2010. So it's designed by Carl Chudik and the artist is Alana Kavernak and Carl Chudik and Kar Kara Judd and a few other people. And the publisher is Asmati Games. It's listed as two to four players, but I've read that it just plays best at two players um, because at four players you're playing in teams. So it doesn't really make a difference, I guess. Um, so yeah, so this is a civilization building game, but with like all cards. Um, but it's got a really good rating, and so I definitely wanted to check it out. I mean 7.3, so maybe not really good, but I'd heard a lot about it recently. Like sometimes that happens, I feel like games just from a long time ago start popping up and you start noticing them. So I'd never heard of it before, um, but I would like to try this out. So I bought that recently. I bought an expansion for Dixit. I bought the Mirrors expansion. Um, and then I bought Stella, Dixit Universe. So I'm looking forward to playing Stella. So this is a new Dixit game. Um, I've heard it's more competitive. I haven't played it yet. Um, I'm glad I think that the cards it comes with are completely new Dixit cards because one of the things I did not like of the original Dixit was the cards in the original Dixit which I thought were kind of boring but I do like the artwork on these cards so so yeah I'm looking forward to playing Stella Dixit. Um, I do think it'll probably be better at a higher player count. I actually don't know how it plays yet so no idea about that. Let me know if you've played Stella Dixit and what you think about it. Um, it comes with like these dry erase boards um, so I wonder what you do with them and there's like a bunch of cards with like words written on them. Oh I just happened to pull out the one that says Cthulhu on it which I think was a promo actually. I got like some promo cards with this game when I bought it. 
Um, but yeah, it comes with these dry erase boards and like this one main big board and then these nice little tokens. Yeah, so I'm looking forward to playing this. Um, so if you've played this, let me know what you think. And then um, some other games I've received. I received a prototype of a deck building game called Feralis Obscure Land. This looks really good. The artwork is really nice. I really like it. Um, I haven't had a chance to play it yet. But I believe this is coming out on Kickstarter in March. The board is pretty plain, but the artwork is really nice. Well, actually, I think I'm supposed to connect both boards. Um, it's a prototype, of course, so... Um, let me just show you some art. Of course, it's a prototype, so not all of the artwork is done yet. So let me just show you a couple of examples of what I do have. Mm, I love that smell. I love the smell of paper and cardboard from freshly opened board games. Yeah, so I mean it's got different decks. It's got a Valkyun deck, a Morale deck, I hope I'm not mis totally mispronouncing these words. Um, a Screel deck and a Gilmora deck. Oh my gosh, look at the artwork. Oh, this is so good. Absolutely love it. So yeah, I'm super excited to play this game. I really like deck building games, so I'm excited to try this one out. So yeah, so I'm covering this for the uh, March Kickstarter. So that's one of the games I'll be covering. There are a couple more that I'm covering, but they haven't arrived yet. So we'll see what those are like when they arrive. So that is Feralis. The next game that I will show you guys that arrived that I backed was Petrichor. So I backed the collector's edition of Petrichor. It's a big box. Um, unfortunately, when you sleeve the cards, they don't all fit. So the box does not go all the way down. The top does not go all the way down to the bottom like I would hope. Um, but these inserts actually are nice. So I actually, you know, will plan on keeping these inserts even though the box doesn't close properly. I like that the rule book has the rules for everything in it. So if you back the collector's edition, it has the rules for the base game, all of the expansions and all of the promo tiles. So I absolutely love that. I love that all the individual players have their own little ring drop because of course you are clouds watering the fields below you. And then um, it's got these inserts where you can hold all of these tokens. Um, I won't go completely inside, but I'll show you the Deluxe Edition Clouds. So the Deluxe Edition Clouds come in this insert. And you have to put them together. Um, they don't feel like the sturdiest clouds. I hope that they will hold up over time. It's like these little plastic thingies um, that connect to, to these. And so you have to just put them together and they will just basically stand up on the different tiles. I think in one way it'll be nice because you'll be able to see the tile below you and have all your raindrops in these clouds. I just hope that they are sturdy enough to hold all the raindrops. Um, but yeah, I absolutely love Petrichor. It is one of my top 10 games of all time. Um, so I'm super excited to have the collector's edition and all of the promo tiles that ever came with this game. So let me just show you, actually I will show you some components. So I went through and I and I sleeved all the cards. Um, but let me just show you some of the tiles. So these are some of the expansion tiles with the different kinds of crops. Um, I really love it. So it's like an area control game with like a very serene theme. Like you don't imagine you know, playing a game, you know, an area control game where you are clouds watering fields below you, but it can be pretty cutthroat. You can like move people's raindrops, you can like, you know, move clouds away, you can, you know, just steal, like kind of steal stuff from people. You are influencing the weather, so you, you know, vote for which weather pattern you want to happen um, after everyone has gone through and placed their raindrops. It's, it's a really good game. I really, really love it. So if you are into games that can be cutthroat, then I highly recommend this game. Um, it can be cutthroat, but it's also just incredibly, you know, it's just beautiful it's you know got a serene theme like a game with a serene theme but that can be very very cutthroat i just really really love it um yeah let me just these cards are all the same i think so yeah so this arrived so i was super excited about that 
And so yeah, you have different weather cards that you'll be playing on your turn. It's been a while since I've played, so I can't tell you exactly how many cards, you know, so you can play a certain weather type and then place a raindrop somewhere, I believe, and a certain number of cards, can, you know, can equal one other type of card if you're missing the kind of card you need. And then you have these tokens that you can try to vote for different weather patterns. So yeah, and you are going to be, you know, having tokens placed here when you're voting, which is like the area majority part and um, the way points are kept are interesting. Um, yeah, I can't really remember the specifics of the game, but I just know I absolutely love it and I think you guys should check it out if you haven't yet. So yeah, so super excited that Petrichor arrived. Um, so I think that's all I have to show you guys this week. Um, so now we can talk about questions. So I actually did not get any questions this week. Oh no, I messed up. One second. So I was not asked any questions, but thank you guys for telling me. Ooh, sorry. <laughs> Let me just quickly do this and get this out of my way and then I can talk. Okay, there we go. Yay. So, as I was saying, I did not get asked any questions this week, but someone um, mentioned that it might be fun for me to talk about which games were the last three games I bought. So I think I actually just showed you guys the last three games I bought. So the last three games I bought were Stella, Dixit Universe, um, Innovation, and the Dixit Expansion. I think those are the last three games that I bought. Um, so what are the last three games that you guys bought? So let me know. Um, I would be curious to know. Let me know if you're backing anything on Kickstarter. I think there are going to be a number of campaigns coming up that I will be excited about. Um, but yeah, I'm really trying not to back too much. I might be going to Florida again later this month and my little sister lives there. And so me and my older sister might go visit her. Um, what else is happening? I think that's it. You know, in the last video I had uh, made a comment about um, being upset about a parking ticket and then someone uh, basically called me a narcissist for parking in a spot that was meant for a truck. So I just want to, you know, I know that, you know, things are made the way they are for a certain reason. I just wanted to address that comment. So I know that, you know, truck spots are there for a certain reason um, so that it can make the jobs of, uh, truckers easier when they are unloading their cargo and delivering it to stores nearby. Um, you know, I was literally parked there for like three minutes. I had a very big box to um, drop off, so I the heating in my apartment is pretty bad. So um, until this year, my heat would go out multiple times every year. So I decided to go out and buy my own space. Well, I didn't go out. I ordered it from Amazon. So I ordered a space heater from Amazon. A space eater did I say eater a space heater from Amazon and the first one I ordered was leaking oil so it was it's an oil radiator um, space heater and so I decided to return it and Amazon returns you need to drop off to a UPS store um, so the UPS store has paid parking nearby um, I didn't want to pay a couple of dollars to just run in and drop off a box but of course it is a very heavy box so I wanted to park nearby so that's why I parked in the truck's uh, parking space for a minute you know interestingly enough like I was only gone for like three minutes I had like my hazard lights on and the guy who was giving me a ticket parked right behind me in his like ticketing car so he was also taking up the truck spot in order to give me a ticket and then go around and give other people tickets as well so he was parked there for quite some time so that was like a little bit um you know ironic but okay um, but yeah, I'm actually going to appeal the ticket, just see if I can appeal it, because I think it's a bit unfair that um, the parking in that area, like there isn't even um, a pay machine, like you have to use your phone in order to park. Um, so, and the phone app charges you a transaction fee, so you're not just paying for parking, which is overpriced anyway, like, you know, for me to have gone in just for a few minutes would have been like a dollar at least, I think. Um, and then you have to pay a transaction fee, which is also almost like a dollar or something like that. So, I, you know, it is a bit weird because like, you know, what if there are people who don't even have smartphones? Like, so what are they supposed to do? Um, you know, it's one of the problems of living in a city that is, you know, becoming gentrified or is gentrified. Um, so, yeah, so I didn't even notice any pay machines or anything like that nearby. 
Um, so yeah, I mean, anyone is welcome to unsubscribe, whatever. If you feel like I'm being a narcissist because I parked in a truck parking spot for a few minutes, then okay, um, that's fine. <laughs> you, you know, you're entitled to your own opinion. I don't know what that has to do with narcissism, but okay, because <laughs> um, I really don't think it has to do with that. Um, you know, but I just wanted to say, like, you know, the people who make these videos, like me, like content creators, like, you know, at the end of the day, we're human. And, um, you know, this wasn't a content creator who made that comment, but, you know, you see other content creators, like, you know, biting, you know, you know, like, what's the word I'm looking for, you know, you know, harassing and bullying other people, like, you know, you people judge each other for, you know, one little thing that they see here and there. It's like, you know, at the end of the day, we're all human. We all make mistakes. I never have ever claimed to be perfect. I am just a human, just like you guys. You know, um, yes, I'm an attorney, but I also do end up breaking the law. I have gotten speeding tickets. You know, no one is perfect. Um, so yeah, so, you know, just something to keep in mind when people watch our videos, my videos, you know, I'm not, you know, I don't think I'm better than anyone else. Um, and at the end of the day, I wish that people would view me as just being like a regular person like all of you guys. So, you know, if you can, you know, I think people are more forgiving to people that they know in person. For some reason, I think it's like, you know, when you watch people online, you just become, people be can be very judgmental, very harsh. They can just pass judgment so easily on things that they might not do in person with someone that they know in person and I really think that people need to give the benefit of the doubt to people who do create content like at the end of the day I'm just a human and you know the same people who attacked me for taking off my mask at Universal Studios were not attacking their own friends who were taking off their masks and you know going out to eat or getting pedicures or getting tattoos like there were people who are going out and getting tattoos in the early days of the pandemic and you know they weren't getting criticized for going to somewhere that is non-essential during the early days of the pandemic even though they were wearing a mask but getting a tattoo is not essential but you know it's just this whole thing of judging people so quickly and just you know <clears throat> attacking people for stuff it's just it, you know I just don't like it I don't like that part of content creation I just you know sometimes it gets to me so I just thought I would address the whole parking ticket um situation but yeah you know anyone's entitled to unfollow me unsubscribe whatever that's fine um but you know at the end of the day i am human just like you guys so anyway so that's all so if you have any questions or comments as always p you know please leave them below and i will get to them next time and sorry for all my babbling i just feel like this video was kind of a mess and i could not speak in proper english Oh, I don't know what it is. I've actually also been a little bit under the weather too. I don't have COVID. I actually got tested for COVID like two days ago um, just because I was feeling under the weather, but I've never, never ever tested positive for COVID. So somehow I think I just have a bit of a cold or something and I'm just feeling a little bit drained because of that. And also I finally got my booster shot yesterday too. Um, so after a very long time, because I got my last vaccine shot like nine months ago, so a very late booster. So maybe I'm just a little bit under the weather because of that as well. And yes, I will stop babbling now. So until next time, guys. Bye.